98% of the world's people are spending 98% of their time on things that don't matter. You have free choice always about everything. But for goodness sake, stop making free choices and call yourself the victim of them. Wake up. Life will never make sense to your mind. <laughs> if you're trying to get life to make sense with your mind, you might as well forget it. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up at seven? My one word is believe and I believe in you. I believe you have an amazing gift inside you that I wanna see explode out onto the world. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being in a car accident and breaking his neck to being homeless and having to live in a tent, making money by getting recycled cans and selling them, to surviving homelessness, eventually writing the best selling book, Conversations with God, and 29 books. He's Neil Donald Walsh, and here's my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. All right, let's kick things off with rule number one, shift your values. For the first 50 years of my life, Mission, I thought that my life was about me. I had the attitude of a 10-year-old or a 9-year-old or a 6-year-old, but I had that attitude when I was 29 or 39. I just, you know, I thought I wasn't a, a bad person. I'm not trying to paint myself as this horrible individual, but I was fairly self-centered. I was looking at my own career, my own goals, my own objectives, my own needs, my own wants, my own desires. I tried to be even-handed about it. If somebody helped me out, I tried to give back if I could and all those things that were taught to do. but. Basically, my life was focused on me. Fascinatingly, even though my life was focused on me virtually all the time, my life wasn't working. I mean, at, at some point in my life, I really got, gosh, I, I can't seem to find happiness that lasts more than a little while. I, I can't seem to find success that lasts more than a little while. Everything is so ephemeral. It just comes in and goes out, comes in and goes out. I never seem to get anywhere to the top of the mountain. When, when is the struggle over? That's what I was experiencing when I had my first conversation with God. So that's the context, that's the background, why I was given that wisdom, because I asked God, okay, obviously there's something here I don't understand. I, I've listened to what my daddy told me, I listened to what my mommy told me, I listened to what my religion told me, I listened to what my culture told me, but there's some missing data. I felt that there was just some information that was missing. So I said to God, what is it? What is it that I don't understand here? The understanding of which would change everything. And God said to me, Neil, it's really very simple. And then she said what you just said here. Neil, your life is not about you. Your life is about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. And I said, well, I don't understand. I'm supposed to give up everything that I ever wanted or desired or hoped for, or give up all of my goals, all of my objectives. And she said, no, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You don't have to set aside all of your goals, set aside all of your objectives, set aside all of the things, that, all of your desires. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. But it's about achieving them, working toward them, moving toward them in a whole different way for a whole different reason. If you're doing those things to enrich the lives of everyone whose life you touch, watch the world fall in on you with wonder and joy and celebration. But if you're doing those things together, to gather, 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 get, 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 have more, have more, have more, that you just like, you know, you just want to get as much as you can for yourself. If that's your prime motivation, you're going to be struggling every day for the rest of your life. Rule number two, connect with your soul. But if we ever began to live our daily life from moment to moment, moving inside the wisdom of our soul, I just finished a book, which will be out in a few months, called The Only Thing That Matters. And The Only Thing That Matters argues for the combining of the mind and the soul in the consideration of our daily choices and decisions. See, the mind holds nothing but experience which it imagines to be knowledge, knowledge, but experience is not knowledge. It's simply experience. And your experience can be warped by all manner of things. Knowledge, true knowledge is held in the soul. Eternal wisdom is held in the soul. 
So our job as human beings is to find a way to marry the mind's experience with the soul's knowledge and to come to a place in, in, in between. When a person does that, they're, they're said to have been centered. So you're really centered in that place between the mind and the soul. All great uh, mystics have found that place. They don't, they don't just reject the mind altogether because the mind's experience is valuable. If I didn't know about the mind's experience, I would, I would touch a hot pan on the stove and burn myself or, or put my hand in the socket and get a shock or walk off the edge of a cliff. So my experience, my mind is a, is a, is a good friend. I'm not saying we should reject our mind, but all the true mystics and masters have found a way to marry the mind of the soul rather than to live exclusively in the mind to the exclusion of the soul. If I, would, if I had one piece of advice for human beings, it would be connect with your soul. Find a way to connect with your soul every day. Not once a week when you go to church or synagogue or temple, but if you even do that, but every single day. How do you recommend people connect? Well, there's a thousand ways to do that. Meditation, guided imagery, visualization, ecstatic dance, the whirling dervishes do it all the time. You know, reading good poetry, praying, you know, there's a thousand ways. But it starts with willingness. You must be willing. You must say, okay, God, or life, or whatever word you want to use that's comfortable to you. I'm here and I'm willing, I'm willing to be quiet for a moment each day with my soul. And if you do that often enough and regularly enough, ultimately you'll discover an opening, something happens. And it's not just a flash, but it, it, it occurs on a regular basis. Rule number three, see life for what it is. But I think what creates anger is the mind thinking that what is going on should not be going on. Mm -hmm. That something else should be happening. Mm -hmm. So the mind starts looking at what's happening and saying, it shouldn't be like this. Mm -hmm. God darn it, it shouldn't be like this. I'm getting pretty mad. This shouldn't be like this. Don't argue with life. It's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And when we stop arguing with life and see it for what it is, see... Here, here's what, here's to tie it all together, Lilu. When I was on the street for a year, toward the end of that time, not at the beginning, I went through a lot of anger, like you're talking about, and, and a lot of uh, uh, frustration mm. uh, and disappointment. But finally, I got to a place where I realized, ah, uh, I see what this is all about. I see what this is. This whole experience that I'm having has been given to me by life as an opportunity for me to really get clear on what's important and who I am and why I'm really here on the earth. And I was so stubborn about it. For me, you know, I had to be hit over the head with a two-by-four. Mm -hmm. I had to really lose everything, lose my family, lose my house, lose my job, lose my income. I, even al I almost lost my life. What threw me on the street was I was in an automobile accident mm -hmm. in which I had my neck broken. Now, you know, most people with a broken neck, God bless them, don't live. You break your neck, you die. And if you don't die, at the very least, you're paralyzed mm -hmm. from here down for life. God bless those folks. Somehow or another, I escaped both. I didn't die and I wasn't paralyzed. But I broke my neck, mm -hmm. sure as we're sitting here. But I, just in the right place, you know, one quarter inch off. And the, the doctors said, you know, it, it, you're, you're so lucky. You're just amazingly lucky that your neck snapped in a place where it wasn't crucial. And there aren't very, very many places like that in your neck, but you, you, you escaped. Now, having escaped death, having escaped life as a, as a paraplegic, and having found yourself on the street with nothing to your name, one pair of shoes, one pair of pants, three shirts, having gone through all of that, what's really important? Rule number four, my personal favorite, fully express yourself. 98% of the world's people are spending 98% of their time on things that don't matter. Mm. That's true. On things that have nothing to do with why we're here. Yeah. We get caught up in our doingness. Oh, you don't understand, I'm a cameraman. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm, a, I'm an audio technician. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. No, you don't understand, I, I do interviews. You know, I write books. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. But those doing this functions are meaningless unless they are ways to demonstrate what we're really here to accomplish. Mm -hmm. 
And what we're really here to accomplish is the fullest expression of who we really are. Mm. People who step into that activity and come from that awareness are people who change the lives of everyone whose life they touch. Rule number five, wake up. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is thinking that the, the things they're doing, that they're required to do them, when in fact they're making a free choice to do that. There are plenty of people who don't work. There are people who actually abandon their families rather than work. They're so unhappy you know, in their life that they just chuck it all and walk away from it. So uh, the, the problem with humanity is we keep on making a series of free choices and then we call ourselves the victims of our own choices. So what I say to people in my audience is, if you don't want to go to work and support your family, then don't. Who's making you do that? Who told you you had to do that? Oh, I just can't walk away. Why not? People do it all the time. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm saying, but when you do what you claim to be the right thing of your own free choice, and then you claim your, yourself to be the victim of doing the right thing, then you're disowning your own self. You're disowning your own choices. For heaven's sake, if you're going to do what you think is right, at least be proud of it. Don't, don't, don't let yourself talk yourself into that you're the victim of it. <laughs> what does that say about you if you're the victim of it? What does that say about you? You know, well, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only supporting my family and paying my bills and doing what's right because I have no choice? <laughs> what does that say about you? No, 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 of course you have choice. There's no such thing as, a, as no choice. So I say to people, let's understand that what this statement means, there's nothing you have to do, there's nothing we have to do, is God's way of telling us it's another, it's, a, it's another way of saying you have free choice always about everything. But for goodness sake, stop making free choices and calling yourself the victim of them. Wake up. Notice what's happening. Every act is an act of self-definition. Everything we do defines who we are. But we shouldn't, you know, do all these wonderful things that define who we are and then fail to lay claim to them, reject them call them not our own. Rule number six, know who you really are. Because a lot of people walk with masks and try to please others. Well, they do. But, and living uh, authentically seems like a really important thing these well, days, of especially. Of course it is. Of course it is. If people are trying to please others, uh, it's because they do not know who they really are. Uh, when you know who you really are and have chosen to step into the living of that, uh, the idea of pleasing someone else becomes less and less useful to you, less and less attractive, e less and less beneficial. Because too often, in order to please someone else, you have to abandon who you really are mm. and betrayal of yourself in order not to betray another mm -hmm. is betrayal nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It's the highest betrayal. Mm -hmm. So we learn that you know, as we get older. Mm. And we learn that, oh, I'm not going to betray myself uh, anymore. Rule number seven, transform fear. The biggest problem on the planet today is fear. It's been a problem for a long time, but it's a huge problem now. It's getting bigger every day. And the reason that fear is a problem, of course, is that it affects everything. Everything we think and say and do, all the decisions and choices we make, all of our reactions, all of our responses, everything that we're experiencing can come from only one of two places. Conversations with God has made that very clear to me. We're either coming from love or we're coming from fear. And my observation is that most people, most of the time, and myself, more than I would like to acknowledge, coming from fear. So we have to look at our fears and find out what is fear anyway? What is it all about? What are we afraid of? And what impact is it having on the choices and decisions and the creations? Uh, for which we have made ourselves responsible. By the way, that's one of the first fears that there is, the fear of being responsible, the fear of uh, placing ourselves in a position of responsibility for all that we are creating. So fear is the first aspect of the human experience, as I understand it, uh, that we need to work very hard uh, to heal, and I might even say to transform. You transform fear, uh, and you transform the world. Rule number eight, focus on the right things. You can't get to the top of Mount Everest if you're deep sea diving. So, you, so if you try to do one thing but doing another, 
obviously you can't accomplish it. So the reason that we can't accomplish what we say we want is that we what we say we want is the wrong thing. We're after the wrong thing. If we truly understood the real reason and purpose of life, we would be wanting and yearning for and seeking to achieve what we came here to achieve why we came to the planet to begin with. That is what, what human life is all about. And what we don't understand is if we did that, if we just retrained our focus to what it is we really were designed to achieve, all the rest would fall in on us without effort. All the things we think we want, peace, health, safety, security, opportunity, love, joy, all the rest, would automatically show up in our lives without, without any effort on our part. Rule number nine, go with the flow. If you're in the middle of difficulties and problems, you know, how can you feel gratitude? And the answer is you've got to fight to find the gift, even in the difficulty. That's what I was talking about earlier. When you shift your perspective from the perspective of the mind, because I want to tell you something, life will never make sense to your mind. <laughs> if you're trying to get life to make sense with your mind, you might as well forget it. Because life will never make sense to your mind. Because mind is very logical and life is not. So, it, so you, in order for life to make sense, you've got to be, I mean this literally, out of your mind. <laughs> and you've got to be into your soul. Mm. And, but when you begin to see life from the perspective of your soul, then even in the midst, as I was saying earlier, even in the midst of the worst of it, you can see the gift. And when you can see the gift, then you can say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this gift, which I would not have been able to perceive had I not uh, embraced the perspective of the soul. But now I see what even this horrible situation is bringing to me. I even see that. Mm -hmm. But again, I want to say something. This is important because mm -hmm. when you see that, when you see the gift and begin to move into gratitude, the very shift the shift away from resisting to gratitude changes the exterior energies such that the situation itself improves sometimes automatically without you doing anything. I have a favorite thing that I like to say. Life will resolve itself in the process of life itself. Mm -hmm. If you simply appreciate life itself. So what I've learned to do is to just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hate this trite beyond belief, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Just let the river go by. Stop trying to make the river go where you think the river is supposed to go. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is be divine. There's something quite extraordinary going on here. Most of us don't even know what it is. We don't know what it's about. We don't even know it's happening. But it is happening. Every moment of every minute of every hour of every day, it's happening. It's life happening all around us. And here's what not very many people really fully and deeply understand, much less appreciate. It's happening for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. There's a mechanism in place. There's a process that's being undertaken in life by life itself. And that process is the process by which we, as the livers of this life, as those who are living into the experience, create the experience we are living into as a means of experiencing and expressing who we really are. That life exists in all of its forms. The beauty of the night sky, the wonder of a garden of flowers, the incredible expression of humanity itself, the feeling of love and the glory of a great idea which has just come to someone and exploded within them, an awareness of something that they can't even name, but they can feel. Ah, they say, that's me. Even as they see the night sky, they see a part of themselves there. There's a way to relate. Even as they see the flowers in a beautiful garden, they can see themselves there. There's something of beauty in me too. And look at this, I'm merely looking at myself in another form. And even as we look at other people, we can relate. 
and we say, there I go, being human, being wonderful, being glorious, being divine. There's something quite extraordinary going on here. It's a process, not only by which we experience ourselves as divine, but by which we define what divinity is to us. Can you imagine a process like this? We're actually creating God through the process of being God as we are choosing to create it. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. That's the miracle of life itself flowing through you, in you, as you. And once you understand what's going on, the purpose of all of it, the divine process, you take part in it in a brand new way. Not unconsciously, but consciously. Not unintentionally, but intentionally. Not accidentally, but on purpose. And you see every golden moment of now as an opportunity to recreate yourself anew the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. And if you do that only for a short time, for an hour a day, an hour a week, an hour a month, your whole life will suddenly make sense to you. And you will touch the world in a way that brings sense to the world. That's how life itself changes and becomes the miracle it was intended to be when you decide to be the miracle you were intended to be. So be it. Being divine. Now I've got a very special bonus clip from Neil on how to ask yourself the four fundamental questions of life. But before that, I wanna know, what did you learn from this video? What was the single biggest lesson that you were going to apply somehow to your life or your business? Leave it down in the comments below. When you write it down, it's much more likely to actually happen for you. So put it down in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is, much love. I'll see you soon and enjoy the bonus clip. So people go through their entire lives without ever asking these extremely powerful and fundamental questions. Number one, who am I? Number two, where am I? That is, what is this place that's called physicality? What am I, where am I, what is this? Number three, why am I where I am? Why am I here? And number four, what is it my opportunity to do about that? What do I intend to do about that? Now I'll give you my, my answers. And by the way, when, when I say where am I, I don't mean where am I right now in the supermarket or at the train station, or I don't mean that. I mean, where am I in the broadest sense? That is, what is this place? this earth, this environment, uh, in the cosmos, what, you know, where am I? So how I would answer those questions if I was looking into the mirror right now, Neil, who am I? I am an individuation of divinity. I am an, ex an expression of God. I am a singularization of the singularity. I am a derivation of the essential essence. I am to God as a wave is to the ocean. Now I know when I say that sometimes it sounds formulaic. That is, it sounds like an answer that I've given a thousand times before. And it sounds like a formula answer. But I'm sorry if it sounds like an answer that I've given a thousand times before because I have given it a thousand times before. I ask myself this question all the time. So, but when you internalize the answer, when it's not just saying something by rote, but saying something in a way that has emotional content and meaning for you. I really am a demonstration of divinity. I really am an individuation of all that is, an individuation of God. That sets a context. It creates a contextual experience of my identity, my true self. Then I go to, to the second question. 
okay, if that's who I am, then where am I? What is this place that I find myself in? And the answer for me is, I am in the realm of the relative, where things are relative to other things, where there's big and small, fast and slow, up and down, left and right, here and there, before and after, now and then, good and evil, male and female. So I am in the realm of the physical, where I have physicalized, because who I am is not physical, it's metaphysical. The singularization of singularity that I am is a soul or a spirit, if you please. But that spirit has chosen to physicalize in the realm of physicality so that I might express and experience myself. That's the third question. Why am I where I am? I am in the realm of the physical because that is the only aspect of the kingdom of God. It's all the kingdom of heaven. It's the only aspect of life, the only place within life's spheres, within the realms of life, where I can really experience and express my true nature. I can't do it in the realm of the absolute, because in the realm of the absolute, I simply know who I am. I always am divine. It's always here, it's always now. I am always the experience and the expression of love. So I am always love here and now, love here and now, love here and now. That's all very lovely to know that, but I want to experience it. I want to express it. So the expression of it is what occurs when I'm in the realm of the physical. And that's why I'm in the realm of the physical. That's why I'm living my life the way I'm living it, because it's giving me a chance to express my true nature. And the fourth question, what is it your opportunity to do about that? That question is answered in every single moment, in every golden moment of now, from one moment to the next. Each moment will provide a stage upon which you can act out, I want to sense, not in the, in the sense of pretending, but in the sense of simply putting into action to act out your decision and your choice about who you are. For instance, right now, because you asked me this question, this golden moment gives me a chance to act out my idea of who I am. And my idea of who I am is that aspect of divinity called clarity. I am clear about who I am, why I'm here, and what my opportunity is. And I'm demonstrating my clarity right now. And that's how the whole formula works. So the first question, and you say you want to ask this to yourself once or twice or twi thrice a day, First question is, who am I? Second question is, where am I? The third question is, why am I here? And the fourth question is, what am I gonna do about it? Beautiful. That's it, it's a very simple formula, but it's very empowering, because you can ask yourself the question anytime, driving in the car, standing in the shower, moving through the post office, it doesn't matter. It, it, you can ask yourself these questions, and it becomes a mental discipline to just check in and make sure that you're on track and it gotten, haven't gotten lost in the labyrinth of life where it starts to seem like you're not who you are and it starts to seem like you have no idea what's going on or why it's happening. More than one person has spent a minute or two asking themselves, well, why is this going on? Why, I don't understand. Why is this happening to me? But if you stay connected to the four fundamental questions of life, those questions go away. Raise your standard. Apple at the core. Its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. Hey, Believe Nation, if you want to see my all-time favorite top 10 rules of success, I have a very special secret video for you. These are the individual clips that I have personally learned the most from and applied to my life and my business. Check the link in the description for details.